will help you identify any of the animals that we may come across. Usually we have pretty good luck. If you plan to take any photos or videos throughout the safari, make sure to have those devices out and ready. This truck will only make a few abrupt stops, but please keep a firm grip on those devices. We won't be able to stop and grab anything that falls out. At least not immediately, and it might not be in the same condition that you had it in. <laughs> also, there is no eating on the safari, so if you have any food out, please put it away. Asante Sana Warden, and if everyone's ready, as we say here in Harambe, Twin Day, which means let's go. I'm going to ask everyone to please remain seated throughout this whole safari. Parents, if you have a child, please keep an eye on them. Make sure they remain seated. Do not lift them up or switch them around. And since we'll be entering into the homes of these animals, let's please be courteous to them. Try not to make too many noises towards them, such as kissing, clicking, whistling, or the general noises you make towards domesticated animals, as these animals are endangered, and it'll scare them away from the truck rather than bring them closer for close encounters. We ventured Little Terry Forest in this region tend to be rather shy. On our right are Okapi. Even though they have stripes, they're not related to the zebra, but to the giraffe. They're so good at hiding that Westerners did not discover them until 1901. It was around that time that researchers found the Okapi had the same skull structure and long prehensile tongue as a giraffe. The mothers also have an infrasonic ability, which is beneath human hearing, so they can communicate with their young ones. Many of the animals in this region have stripes or markings on them. That helps them to better camouflage with their natural surroundings. On our left are black rhinoceros. Black rhinos have a triangular shaped lip with a prehensile upper lip so they can reach up into trees and higher up bushes to grab leaves. They can weigh about 3,000 pounds. And while they don't have any natural predators, they are endangered by poachers who tend to poach them for their horns made out of keratin, the same material as their hair and nails. Now there are less than 5,000 black rhinos left in the world. Disney helps support conservation programs that keep an eye out on rhino population and help better protect rhinos from poachers. While over on our right are bongos and greater kudu. Bongos are known to be the ghosts of the forest as they are rarely seen. They're the largest and heaviest of forest antelope, while greater kudu are the tallest. Both male and female bongos have horns that tilt back to help them get through the low underbrush pretty quickly, while only the male greater kudu have horns and are more solitary, while the females do not have horns and will tend to gather in groups of 3 to 10. Safi River real soon, so if you notice any shadows lurking beneath the water, it just might be a Nile hippopotamus. Hippos are able to hold their breath for about eight minutes at a time. And despite being in water most of the day, they're not big on swimming. They'd much rather drop down to the bottom and walk or glide around. They also have a pair of incisors that can grow to be about 18 inches long, which they use mostly for defense as they are the most territorial, but they are a vegetarian. The hippo calf will weigh 80 to 100 pounds, while adults can weigh up to 4,000. 
Mm -hmm. Hippo calves will nurse underwater with their mothers, and the females of the bloat will help the mother protect the calf. There's also a pink back pelican. They get their pink color during their mating season. They're known to be colonial birds, which means they'll nest in groups of 20 to 500. Parents will take turns in nesting on their eggs, and they'll incubate those eggs for about 30 days before they hatch. for nine months out of the year. They're a great resource during times of drought because they tend to hold a lot of water. And since their tree trunks hold so much water in them, they're also referred to as the tree of life. hyena. <coughs> they're not part of the feline or canine families. They're part of a family of their own called Hyena Day. Between the two genders, the females are the most dominant. Even the lowest strength female will still be the highest strength among all males. quite the strong bite force that can bite even through bone. On our left are sable antelopes. Their horns are hard and tilted back so if a lion attacks them they can easily knock them off. They also happen to be the animal on the emblem of Harambe Wildlife Reserve. There's also Ancoli cattle, also known as Watusi cattle, named after the Watusi clan that first domesticated them. Their horns are quite large with many chambers, much like a beehive's, to keep them at their regular body temperature throughout the whole year. They're the breed you usually find on ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. There's also termite mounds around. Termite mounds are a compilation of mud, saliva, and dung hardened under the sun to be as hard as concrete. Elephants will use them as a scratch post while it antelopes will use them to look out for predators. Uh, up ahead are Maasai giraffe. You can tell them apart from reticulated giraffe due to their patterns. Reticulated have a more net-like pattern while Maasai have a more patchy pattern. When a young giraffe comes into the world it's with quite a shock. 
Mothers give birth while standing up, so babies will drop six feet to the ground. They're usually up pretty soon though, and standing at six to eight feet tall. They also have very good eyesight. That combined with their long necks help them to see quite far throughout the savanna, including any predators hiding in tall grass. Their necks are their weakest point though, so they try to keep them up as often as they can, <laughs> whether they're sitting or standing up, which may be a reason why they sleep for about 30 minutes a day. But they're browsers, so they'll spend most of their time eating. Well, on our right are zebra. And those zebras have a flap of skin under their neck called a dewlap. It helps circulate their blood and keeps them cool. While most of stock have a dewlap, those zebras are the only zebras to have them. They're the Hartman's Mountain Zebra. When a young zebra is born, they've already got their full-grown legs and they're able to imprint immediately on their mother's stripes so they know which zebra to stick to. And much like a giraffe's patterns, the zebra stripes are a lot like our fingerprints. There are no two alike. Each pattern and stripe are very unique to itself, which is also how we're able to tell all of them apart from each other. There is also a herd of brindled wildebeest. They're part of a large migration group that happens every year in Africa. About 1.5 million of them take part in it. This can be seen from satellites up in space as a weather phenomena, usually viewed as a large dust cloud moving slowly about. At night, wildebeest will also line up in rows, so if a predator comes upon them, they can all just jump up and start running for it without bumping into one another. On our right is an African elephant. African elephants have very large ears with many blood vessels in them so they can flap those ears around, as well as long trunks that can grow to be about 10 feet long. Uh, over on our left are mandrels. Mandrels are identified by their blue and red face markings, which tend to glow brighter as they get more excited. Much like chipmunks, mandrels also have cheek pouches so they can store their snacks for later. If you see them bearing teeth at each other, it's so they can strengthen their familial bond. A herd of elephants is comprised of females and children, as males tend to be more solitary. Male elephants will stray away from their herd, either alone or in a bachelor group. While the herd is also led by a matriarch, which is usually the oldest female. She'll have all the past knowledge of previous elephants before her and will try her best to pass that knowledge down to the next generation. Scientists also found that elephants are quite afraid of bees. Since they have such good hearing, they're able to hear the buzzing a lot closer than it is, and it'll spook them. They'll even warn everyone else around to stay clear of the area. So the scientists gave that information over to farmers in Africa, and the farmers were able to set up beehive fences. This kept the elephants safely away from crops, and the farmers also gained a new form of income, which was the honey from the bees. On our right, you'll see some test marks in the cliff slide. That's because elephants enjoy eating the red clay. It gives them an important source of vitamins they're not able to get much anywhere else. Quite a lot like the multivitamins that many of us eat. They also have very sensitive skin, so if you see them throwing something on their back, such as mud, sand, dirt, or something else of that sort, it's usually as a sunscreen to help better protect themselves from those UV rays. Elephants are often endangered by poachers who tend to poach them for their ivory tusks. We can help to stop this by trying to buy nothing with ivory in it. In doing so, it should break down the ivory market, which in turn means the poachers would lose their purpose for going after the ivory of both hippos and elephants. There's 
also more baobab trees around. They're pretty important to the savanna ecosystem. Without them, the animals would lose another source of water during the dry season, which is why conservation groups are keeping an eye out on their number and trying to increase them whenever they can, especially since they've been dwindling them out recently. Greater flamingo, the lightest shade of pink flamingo. They get their pink color from a source known as beta carotene, found in shrimp and other sea creatures they eat. They're not migratory, they prefer to stay in their same area as long as they have enough food. They will travel at night though if that food runs scarce, and they need to find a new watering hole with an abundance of it. When flamingos first hatch out of their eggs, they are not pink already. They do start out as little gray chicks that take about two to three years to gain their pink color. If you're looking for any animal encounters after safari, you can head over to Gorilla Falls Trail. You'll find a variety of animals there, such as gorillas, monkeys, meerkats, naked mole rats, a different breed of zebra, as well as an underwater hippo viewing area. There's also an aviary there where you can bird watch and walk alongside some birds. Besides Gorilla Falls, you can also take Rafiki's Planet Wash. That's a train that leaves every now and then to the conservatory. Last train of the evening will leave at 4.30. It'll go around every five to seven minutes until then. And over at the conservatory, you can pet some goats over in the affection section. See a few more animals as well as more reptiles and amphibians. It's also where the animation center is, where every now and then they'll teach you how to draw a certain character alongside a Disney animator. <laughs> On our left are cheetahs. Cheetahs are the fastest mammals. They can run at 60 miles an hour in just three seconds. Mm -hmm. They can only keep that speed up for a few hundred yards before it wears them out, and they need to take a nice rest before going at it again. Cheetahs are also one of the few big cats that hunt during the day since they rely more on speed rather than strength like other big cats use and also have a long black streak under their eyes that helps to deter the sunlight away. Uh, up ahead are Kopi rocks. That's a rock formation that happens out on the savanna. Usually predatorial animals will make it their home and use it to scan the area for prey. You'll see lions up there. Male lions are the ones with the mane of hair around their neck. Females don't have that. Instead, the lioness is known to be the hunters of the pride. While the lioness is out hunting for food, male lions will stay behind to guard their homes and young ones. Lions sleep for about 18 to 20 hours in a day. And during the day, their vision is a lot like ours. But come nighttime, their eyesight will become six times greater. Warthogs. Warthogs are known to be the recyclers of the savanna. They'll take up any empty or abandoned burrows as their new home and 
it back up into those burrows with their tusks pointed out as a way to better protect themselves from any predators. Uh, over on our right are white rhinos. They were first named by Dutch settlers as white rhino, white meaning white, due to their large, wide mouths. They're much larger than black rhinos. They can weigh about four to 5,000 pounds. <laughs> and again, have no natural predators. They're mostly endangered by poachers. There are no longer any northern white rhinos, but there are still the southern ones around. And even though they're called black rhinos and white rhinos, they're still both gray. The only real difference is their size and their shape of lip. And if you see any rhinos rolling around or covered in mud, that is not only as a sunscreen, but also as a bug repellent to help keep the bugs off of them. Looks like we're nearing the warden's post. The warden moved down here to be closer to the animals as a way to better protect them from poachers. And if we take a closer look at the post, there are Nigerian dwarf goats. They're rheumatary, which means they have a pot belly because their stomach has four chambers to it to better break down food. Much like the okapi and giraffe. They're quite playful. They like to chase, butt heads, and climb as a way to show that they're maturing. They can also make pretty great pets since they don't take up too much space. And they'll help pastures out by eating the weedy, grassy areas other animals tend to not eat. The dwarfs also provide a great resource, being their goat cheese and sweet milk, which is why villagers keep them very well protected on their property, as it also keeps the villagers from having to go into animal territory for things such as clearing more land for crops or other sources of income. And in turn, the animals out in the wild will be able to keep more of their habitats as they are. Which makes it a great symbiotic relationship between humans and animals so far. If you have an animal you like or a favorite one, you can help them out by donating to the Disney Conservation Fund or any other wildlife fund to help better protect the animals out of the wild. There are also non-monetary ways to help out, such as reusing and recycling items, joining in on a beach or a river cleanup, or planting plants in your backyard that will help the wildlife in your area. That's just to name a few of them though, you can talk to the villagers out in Harambe Village for more tips and tricks on how to better conserve and help out wildlife. If there are any wilderness explorers on board, you are riding on Simba 1. Simba. That is Simba 1 for all you wilderness explorers. say Kwaharini. Kwaharini means farewell in Swahili. Go ahead and double check your rows. Make sure nothing fell out of any bags or pockets. It is a long way back to Africa. And those of you on the right, please watch your hands, feet, legs, and arms as those doors are opening. Kwaharini, everybody.